right, let's go to the murder of Martha Moxley. The night before Halloween, 1975, Connecticut teenager Martha Moxley left her house to attend a neighborhood party. Her body was found the next morning beneath a tree in her backyard, brutally beaten by a golf club. 25 years went by until Michael Skakel, who was also 15 at the time, was arrested, charged, and convicted of a murder. The case drew worldwide attention since Skakel was a nephew of Robert F. Kennedy's widow. Because of his family's wealth, he had lived life in and out of rehab for alcohol, trying out for the Winter Olympics, and flunking out of multiple schools. This guy's led a weird life. Skakel's alibi seemed bizarre, that he had been uh, engaging in self-pleasure under that tree earlier the same night, accounting for DNA found on the body, but that he had no connection to the crime. That was his defense. <laughs> He had a letter written on his behalf by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and after numerous appeals, was given a new trial in 2012 due to prosecutor misconduct and a poor defense. He's currently out on bail waiting for the new trial to start. I mean, how bizarre is this one? Why would he be behind her house? Like, anybody actually bought his uh, alibi? Uh, it could be weird because it could just be uh, looking for somebody. Or make sure it's the correct test that you're supposed to be at. Well, let's go through some more background details. So, on the evening of October 30th, 1975, Martha Moxley left with friends to participate in Mischief Night, in which neighborhood youths would ring bells and pull pranks such as toilet papering houses. So let this be to a warning to everybody out there that Mischief Night is, uh, is not safe. According to friends, Moxley began flirting with and eventually kissed Thomas Skakel, Michael's brother. Okay, now we have a motive. Moxley was last seen falling together behind the fence with Thomas Skakel near the pool in the Skakel backyard at around 9.30 p.m. The next day, Moxley's body was found beneath a tree in her family's backyard. Her pants and underwear were pulled down, but she had not been sexually assaulted. Pieces of a broken six-iron golf club were found near the body. An autopsy indicated that she had been both bludgeoned and stabbed with the club, which was traced back to the Skakel home. Thomas Skakel was the last person seen with Moxley on the night of the murder, and he had a weak alibi. He became the prime suspect, but his father forbade access to his school and mental health records. Kenneth Littleton, who had started working as a live-in tutor for the Skakel family only hours before the murder, also became a prime suspect. However, no one was charged, and the case languished for decades. In the meantime, several books were published about the murder, including Timothy Dumas's nonfiction A Wealth of Evil, 1999. Dominic Dunn's fictional account of the case, A Season in Purgatory 2000, and Mark Furman's nonfiction Murder in Greenwich. Over the years, both Thomas and Michael Skakel significantly changed their alibis for the night of Moxley's murder. Michael claimed that he had been window peeping in the tree beside the Moxley property from 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. Two former students from Elan School, a treatment center for troubled youths, should we say youths or youths? <laughs> I would youths. You, you don't like youths? You don't want to go the, the My Cousin Vinny route? <laughs> no, no, I do enjoy that. Well, whenever we're discussing any kind of criminal case, and uh, th that always reminds me of My Cousin Vinny, and whenever they repeatedly use the word youths, it makes me want to say youths. Uh, for troubled youths testified they heard Michael confess to killing Moxley with a golf club. Gregory Coleman testified that Michael was given special privileges, saying Michael bragged, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. You know what's weird, though? If these are disturbed individuals, he might have been wanting to take credit for his brother. Like, let's say his brother really killed her, but and he wanted, he wanted you know, fame and notoriety, and he wanted to impress other people. And if he's mentally deranged, and these are other mentally deranged people, would he lie and try to take credit for the murder that his brother allegedly might have committed? That's uh, completely possible in the realm of, uh, well, yeah, possibility. Because it wouldn't be the first one to have done that. Yeah, I always, it, taking things at face value is always uh, problematic. 
at least for me, because it doesn't seem we have to at least consider other possibilities. Investigation reopened when William Kennedy Smith was tried and acquitted for rape in 1991. A rumor surfaced that he had been present at the Skakel House on the night of the Moxley murder, with the clear insinuation that he might have been involved. Although this proved to be unfounded, it resulted in a new investigation of the then cold case. The Sutton Associates, a private detective agency hired by Rushton Skakel in 91, conducted its own investigation into the killing. The Sutton report later leaked to the media revealed that both Thomas and Michael Skakel altered their stories about their activities the night Martha was killed. You know, the other thing that's weird that we need to always talk about, when you're dealing with shady individuals, they could be involved in other shady things. So they could have been involved in other shady things, either illegal or legal, and they simply changed their story to cover up other illicit activities. That doesn't mean they're guilty of this one, right? Because, again, if we're dealing with shady individuals... Although the more I'm reading about this case, the more it seems like there might have been more than one person involved. Especially if these are weird, mentally disturbed individuals. There could have been two or three people involved in her, in her murder. A group killing. Or it could have been an accident with only one of them involved and possibly one or two people helping move the body or doing whatever. And if these are teenagers, then they might not be thinking, wait a second, we have to not use the golf club from our own house or whatever. I mean, if they're, if they're fifth, you know, if these if these are teenagers and something traumatic happens and they're mentally disturbed on top of it, they might not be thinking logically and rationally. So it might be it, it might not be reasonable for us to assume thinking with clear minds that they would do this or that or wouldn't do or it would be too obvious. I'm not sure about that. I'm not a mentally disturbed, emotionally distraught teenager who may or may not have, you know, been involved in other illicit activities. So. In 1993, author Dominic Dunn, father of the murdered actress Dominique Dunn, published A Season in Purgatory, a fictional story closely resembling the Moxley case. Mark Furman's 98 book, Murder in Greenwich, named Michael Skakel as the murderer and pointed out numerous mistakes the police had made in investigating the case. Even in the years before the Dunham and Furham books, Greenwich police detectives Steve Carroll and Frank Garr, as well as the police reporter Leonard Levitt, had become convinced that Michael Skakel was the killer. The trial in June 98, a rarely invoked one-man grand jury, was convened to review the evidence of the case. After an 18-month investigation, it was decided that there was enough evidence to charge Michael Skakel with the murder. On January 9, 2000, an arrest warrant was issued for an unnamed juvenile for Moxley's murder. Skakel surrendered to authorities later that day. He was released shortly after on $500,000 bail. On March 14th, Skakel was arraigned for murder in a juvenile court as he was 15 years old at the time of Moxley's murder. On January 31st, 2001, a judge ruled that Skakel would be tried as an adult. Skakel's trial began on May 7th, 2002 in Norwalk, Connecticut. He was represented by attorney Michael Sherman. Skakel's alibi was that at the time of the murder, he was at his cousin's house. During the trial, the jury heard part of a taped book proposal, which included Michael Skakel speaking about pleasuring himself in a tree on the night of the murder, possibly the same tree which Moxley's body was found the next morning. In the book proposal, Skakel did not admit to committing the murder. Prosecutors took words from the book proposal and overlaid them on graphic images of Moxley's dead body in a computerized multimedia presentation shown to jurors during closing arguments. In the audio tape, Skakel said that he was afraid he might have been seen the previous night jerking off and he panicked. Though the jury heard the whole tape during the closing arguments, the prosecutor did not play that part of the audio tape, giving the impression that he was con confessing to the murder. I guess they just used the clip he might have been seen, and he panicked. <laughs> That's kind of shady. In, on June 7, 2002, Skakel was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years life in prison. He was assigned to Garner Correctional Institution in Newton, Connecticut. The prosecutor's use of the multimedia presentation during closing arguments was included in Skakel's initial appeal, 
In the brief responding to the appeal, the prosecution argued the state engaged in appropriate and effective advocacy by using trial exhibits to highlight certain evidence and inferences. Just as the state should not be deprived of its most valuable evidence unless there is a compelling reason to do so, the state should not be prohibited from making its best arguments. The state's use of audio and photographic exhibits during argument was a matter of effective advocacy. The state did not, as defendant claims, distort the evidence in any respect. By placing certain exhibits next to defendant's words or by displaying two related exhibits simultaneously, the state was making explicit the inferences it was asking the jury to draw. That is the job of an advocate. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. later wrote that Skakel was a small, sensitive child. The runt of the litter with a harsh and occasionally violent alcoholic father who both ignored and abused him. According to neighbors and family friends, the Skakel children were given unlimited amounts of money and were largely unsupervised. <laughs> they don't mention the older brother who was seen with Moxley. Which is, uh, uh, is a mention more. He's a mention more. Oh. Unless they somehow, unless the, he's, he actually has a real alibi immediately after that, that was corroborated by many, many people that lead the police to believe it was impossible he was responsible. But I don't know, that whole family seems shady to me. Indeed it does. Especially if then, as you said, Jesse, before that, uh, the younger brother could have uh, taken credit. Yeah, a lot of disturbed, or there could have been more than one person responsible there. Very true.